Welcome to another episode of The Unseen Paranormal, where some of the scariest things are unseen. I'm your host, Eric Freeman. Hey, everybody. Welcome to this week's show. Today, we have another great guest for you. We are talking to English professor Dr. Alan Brown from the University of West Alabama. Alan is an author and researcher of Southern folklore, ghost stories, and legends. He has authored over a dozen books on ghosts and hauntings. He is affiliated with the American Folklore Society, the American Ghost Society, and Birmingham Paranormal Society. We're going to discuss his latest book, The Haunted South. You can find his book on Amazon and other online retailers. Welcome to the show, Dr. Brown. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. So you've written quite a few books on the paranormal And you've been an English professor for a long time, so this is kind of your area of research that you've kind of delved into the folklore of uh, ghosts and hauntings. And so what got you so interested in writing books and doing research on the paranormal and folklore? Well, I was uh, fairly new to the South. I was born and raised in Midwest, in Illinois, and I moved down here in 1986 to get a teaching job. And uh, that's when I discovered the rich oral traditions that they have down here, particularly related to ghost lore. There was a local woman in Sumter County, Alabama, named Ruby Pickens Tart, who collected uh, folklore from African Americans for the WPA in the 1930s. And a lot of these stories that she collected were ghost stories. And so I was inspired by her to do the same thing, to carry carry on where she left off. And uh, I pretty much follow her format. I like to start with the history of this site and then include the sightings that people have had, the stories that have been passed down from one generation to the next, that sort of thing. We just don't have that kind of oral tradition up north, at least not where, not the part of the uh, Midwest where I was from. People are, I guess, not as willing to share their paranormal experiences up there as they are down here. Yeah, and down here in the south, I live in Middle Tennessee outside of Nashville, and there's everybody loves to talk about the history, and then this time of year, especially with uh, the holiday season, uh, with the Halloween and all that stuff, it, it's definitely got the ghost tours and the ghost stories and, and all of that going on. Yeah, yeah. well, the thing about, um, about the Deep South, though, is that they tell ghost stories all year long. I give a ghost walk in uh, Livingston, Alabama, which is where I teach. And I I give one in October. In fact, I'm giving the first one October 15th. But I also give them in the spring during a big uh, folk festival we have. And the size of the crowds is about the same. So people just like to be scared. They And they, they like to have these vicarious experiences that other people say they have had at specific historic sites. Yeah, that's that's pretty interesting that it, there's such a difference between the north and the south with that, and that here, you know, it's popular year-round, not just around the Halloween season. So as far as all your research throughout Tennessee, what are what were some of your favorite places that you got stories from? Oh, there's so many of them. In my book, The Haunted South, I wrote about Magnolia Manor. I guess one of the most active sites I've ever actually spent a night at. My wife and I enjoy traveling around the South collecting ghost stories, and I always take her with me because, number one, she just likes to travel, and she likes to go to these beautiful old antebellum mansions. But she's also my ghost magnet. I have always wanted to have paranormal experiences, and I very rarely do. She has them all the time, and I think that's because she's more sensitive than I am. I think there are people that have are probably born with that ability. The irony is, she's a retired math teacher, so she's very logically minded. But she's the one who has all these strange experiences, uh, and not me. But uh, we had, she had one at Magnolia Manor. Magnolia Manor was built in 1849 for Judge Austin Miller. And it is historically significant in that General Grant and his generals planned the Battle of Shiloh there. Now, the story goes that while they were staying at Magnolia Manor, General Sherman went up to Mrs. Miller and told her that uh, 
he wouldn't mind at all if all Southern men, women, and children were exterminated. Well, she was she was outraged. She went up to Grant, told him what had happened. Grant made Sherman apologize to her, and he did, but he was so irate that he marched up the stairs, took his saber out, and slashed the banister, and that cut mark is still on the banister. Wow. And you can see it when you go in into the bed and breakfast. The most haunted room is the 1849 room. It's haunted for a couple of reasons. There is a uh, uh, a girl who died there. Her name was Priscilla. She was 18 years old. Her portrait hangs above the fireplace mantel. And the owner told me that uh, in the 1980s they had a uh, a psychic come stay there, and uh, she brought a small group of six people with her, and, and she went to the 1849 room, and she asked if she could touch Priscilla's portrait, and the lady said, yes, you can. Well, she, uh, she left and came back a, a few minutes later, and everyone was excited because the psychic said that that portrait flew off the mantle toward her. Well... The owner of the mansion went up to her to see if she had, like, strings or fishing line tied to her hands. She didn't. And it had just happened. Well, my wife and I stayed there. And 2 o'clock in the morning, Melon woke me up and told me that someone had stroked her arm with their hand. And, and she thought she thought it felt like a woman's hand. Well, we immediately take pictures. And so we took pictures all over the room. And... He captured some orbs above a wardrobe. We talked to the uh, owner the next morning, and she said that a man had stayed in that same room a few weeks earlier, and he was awakened by a female apparition that was pulling on the sleeve of his pajamas. And he was he was frantic. He got dressed, ran out of the room, and jumped in his car and left, and left his luggage there. We did not find this to be a particularly frightening experience, or well, at least my wife didn't. I was asleep when it happens. I'm always asleep when she has these experiences. But, uh, no, she wasn't terrified by it. Uh, it was as if the spirit was trying to get her attention. Yeah. And I think that's, uh, um, most of the experiences that we have had have been of this type, where a spirit wants to make their presence known somehow. It's a way of saying, hey, I'm here. And they're not malignant or anything. And uh, that's our experience there. And I would uh, I would recommend Magnolia Manor, which is a boulevard, by the way. I would uh, I would recommend that for anyone who's interested in history and or ghosts too. And these people don't uh, I don't know that they advertise that their bed and breakfast is haunted, but they don't hide it either. Now there are some bed and breakfasts that promote their ghosts. Right, like the Myrtles in St. Francisville down in Louisiana, but uh, a lot of them don't. But that doesn't mean that they won't tell you ghost stories and and that sort of thing. And and that's the way uh, Magnolia Manor is. And and like I say, I would I would recommend it, that place to anyone who is interested in the past and in ghost lore as well. And Bolivar is down towards the Memphis area in Tennessee. Yes. And that whole area seems to have a lot of lot of ghost tales and a lot of haunted places. I am familiar with the Ames Plantation in Hickory Valley. I'm particularly interested in this story because it is haunted by sound, specifically by the residual songs of slaves working in the fields. People have heard work songs and they've heard spirituals being sung out in the field. And being a folklorist, I'm really, really interested in in music and ghost music, too, although that's not that common. This is one of the few places I know of where people have heard the singing of slaves. I think one of the most infamous houses in Tennessee is in Kingsport. It's Rotherwood Mansion, which was built in 1818 by Reverend Frederick Ross. And it's one of those tragic, sad places it has an oppressive atmosphere when you go there. I've heard people uh, say that. There was a, a girl, young woman there named Rowena, who uh, fell in love with a young man, and they were engaged to be married. Just a few weeks prior to their engagement, to their wedding, he went fishing with some buddies of his in the river, and the boat overturned, 
everyone survived but him. So she uh, immediately sank into uh, depression, which lasted years. She finally married a wealthy man from Knoxville, had a child nine months after their wedding. Then, for some reason, she went to the same river, to the Hudson River, where her fiancé had drowned and drowned herself. Now, there's another variant of this story that holds that she was, uh, she actually married a third time and had the child and heard the ghost of her first lover beckon to her to join him in the river. And she tried once, and they, her relative stopped her, but the second time she succeeded and drowned. Well, her father went bankrupt not long after this happened, sold the plantation to a man named Joshua Phipps in 1847, and he was, uh, he was a sadist. He was just about as close as you can get to Simon Legree from uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin. He, he reveled in cruelty. And earned a, a reputation of being a cruel, horrible man. None of his neighbors liked him. They said that they could hear the screaming of his slaves from way off. And uh, he even had a, a whipping post uh, mounted in one of the bedrooms in his mansion so that he could easily whip them when he was so inclined. Wow. Uh, well, the story goes that he took ill for some unknown reason, and uh, some terrible disease, and, and a slave who was tending to him said that he was lying in, Phipps was lying in bed, and this swarm of black flies started hovering around over his body, and they finally covered his head and climbed into his mouth. He choked to death on flies. You can believe that. I'm not sure I believe that or not, but the <laughs> Again, that's one. That's one of those stories I've never heard before. Of course, flies are are connected to Satan, yeah, who is the yeah. Lord of the Flies, or Beelzebub, I should say. So, I guess that explains why uh, he died that way. Well, uh, Rotherwood Mansion is supposed to be haunted by his ghost. People have heard his maniacal laughter echo through the house, and they have. Uh, oh, he he likes to throw things. He likes to hide things. He pulls the covers off people as they're asleep. They've heard the screams of slaves. It's, it's just, like I say, a very negative place because of all the tragedy that has happened there. I think uh, well, another disturbing story is from Purdy, Tennessee. This is the Hearst House, which is currently being restored. Uh, it was built in 1834 by Fielding Hearst, who was a unionist. He was a Tennessean who was a Union sympathizer, which, of course, means that he was immediately ostracized by all of his neighbors. He eventually became a uh, cavalry officer for the uh, Union Army and was a very brutal, cruel man. When he and his forces uh, raided Purdy, they burned the church, burned the courthouse, raided private homes. It got so bad that even Union sympathizers didn't like this man. Well, after the war, uh, he went bankrupt and died alone in 1882. The legend is that he was shot at the top of the stairs and that you can see his the blood stain uh, in the carpeting. Well, he was not shot. I'm not sure how he died, but that's not how he died. But that, has, of course, has not kept people from telling stories about the haunting of the place. Supposedly, investigators have had their uh, batteries drained in their cameras when they tried to take photographs of the, the blood stain. Like I say, all kinds of haunted places in Tennessee. I wrote a, I wrote a book on uh, Tennessee ghosts and had no trouble, no trouble finding stories. I, I went to some of these places. There's some that I would like to go to, like the Ryman Auditorium in Nashville. Have you been there? Not in a paranormal capacity, but I've been there many times for concerts and, and other things. Yeah. A lot of old theaters, there are a ton of ghost stories connected with it. Uh, it was founded as the Union Gospel Tabernacle by the uh, owner of a steamboat company named Thomas Ryman. The story goes he was a very sinful man who owned a chain of saloons and uh, uh, had gambling in his steamboats, and he met a preacher in uh, Nashville, whose name was Jones, and he befriended Ryman and uh, 
converted him. Uh, Ryman even sold the saloon that he owned in Nashville, and so uh, he became a uh, he became a Christian, a devout Christian. And again, story goes that he uh, hosted a, a union of Confederate veterans there. Now he built it in 1892, so this would have been the 1890s. And the uh, veterans said they they wanted to hold their reunion there every year, so they paid to have the balcony built, and it was called the Confederate Gallery. Well, that gallery is haunted by a soldier in a long gray coat. Well, now, we're not sure he's a soldier, but it's a man, an older man in a long gray coat, who is seen seated up in the gallery. doesn't interact with people. He's just sitting there. Ryman himself is an active presence. He makes his presence known only when there's something going on on the stage, a performance that is risque in nature. And when that happens, they say that scenery falls down, the volume goes down on the uh, on the loudspeakers. Singers have been struck mute, and they can tell that Mr. Rhyme is not happy. And so, as a rule, they they would switch to something that is more family friendly. After that, probably the most famous ghost in the Ryman Theater is Hank Williams. Yeah, that's the one that I've heard a lot about. I've, I heard a little oh, bit yeah. about about Mr. Ryman. But I hadn't heard about the, the apparition scene sitting up in the gallery. Yeah, well, people, I don't know that he his apparition appears to people, but they they can tell by the, by the type of interruptions that this is probably him who doesn't like to have non-Christian type performances going on in his building. Yeah. Uh, now, Hank, Hank Williams, story goes that between performances he would, sneak out the back door, and go to the honky-tonks uh, nearby, like Tootsie's Orchid Lounge. And then he'd come back after having a couple of, of uh, drinks and perform. There was a uh, construction worker who was uh, working by himself in one, uh, the upper floor and uh, fell asleep. When he woke up, he discovered that he was locked in. And he heard music coming from the stage and he walked down the stairs and walked over to the stage and there was this rather short, very thin, pallid looking man with a cowboy hat strumming a guitar and uh, he went out, walked up to him and started talking to him and the figure vanished. And he he had seen photographs of Hank Williams before and he was pretty pretty sure of it, uh, that that's who this was. I have found it interesting that the Hank Williams Honky Tonk is also haunted, which, like I said, is right next to the Ryman Auditorium. Yeah. Tootsie Best was the woman who uh, who owned it. It had, in the 1890s, it was used as a bordello. And usually buildings that had that kind of past are almost always active. And that's the case here. Although it's not one of the ladies of the evening who is responsible, it's Tootsie herself. Uh, she has passed on. And they say that uh, when there's activity going on in the bar that she does not approve of, that she will punch people in the back. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's how she does it. And uh, she never put up with that sort of thing when she was alive and yeah. apparently doesn't do it when, after she's gone either. Kind of a feisty lady in life and in death. Yes. <laughs> well, yeah, a very feisty ghost. Hey, this is a... Uh, this is a motif that you find in a, in a lot of legends circulating around haunted places that uh, uh, they want they want their buildings or their homes or their businesses treated with respect. And if people don't, then they their anger erupts in paranormal ways. And that's certainly true true in that case. Yeah, and and these people spent. I mean, especially somewhere like Tootsie's, you know, they they put their whole life into a place like that, or they spent lots of oh, times yeah. there, and it was a place they loved and they enjoyed being there. And so they want the the future people now, even though they're dead and gone, they still want the people to take mm-hmm. care of it and respect it. Yeah, the Capitol Records building in Nashville has a similar type of haunting. It is built on the site of the Snell House, which was. Built around 1900 by a man who was, uh, uh, I'm not sure if he's a Yankee or not, but I do know that people didn't like him, uh, probably because he was not from old money. He had made his money in business. He had two uh, two daughters who were not 
invited to any balls or any social gatherings, and and they ended up becoming old maids, uh, and they died in the house. Well, afterwards, uh, Capitol Records bought the building and raised it and uh, erected a uh, uh, rather bland-looking gray 11-story building in its place. And they say that uh, a lot of poltergeist activity goes on there, electrical equipment, malfunctions, doors open and close, they hear spectral laughter, phantom footsteps, faint whispers. And some locals believe that the Schnell sisters are unhappy at the fact that their beautiful home was replaced by this drab-looking building. And so that's why they create all these disturbances. Uh, yeah, there's something about human beings that that makes us want to explain the unexplainable. And and that results in all of these wonderful ghost legends, which oftentimes don't hold up well to close scrutiny. Now, I have not done a lot of historical research into that particular building, but uh, I suspect that there are probably other reasons for these sounds, strange sounds people hear. But as someone who is interested in the folklore, I... I am actually more interested in the, I guess, in the stories themselves and in the the historical veracity of the stories. Yeah. Uh, but uh, now that doesn't mean, though, that I don't enjoy dabbling in the paranormal, uh, because I I think it's I think it's important to keep these oral traditions going, and one way you do it is by adding to them uh, year after year, and and uh, I think paranormal investigators do this. Right. Uh, and and you're adding to it, I mean, especially since you said your wife has lots of experiences when y'all go and stay places and, and so yeah, that's yeah. adding to the to the folklore, adding to the stories. Yes. And, yes. and and I'll tell you something else about paranormal investigators. I think one of the best things that has happened to the field is the um uh, television shows that actually started around around two thousand five or so with Ghost Hunters on the sci-fi channel and then you now you've got this proliferation of paranormal shows on channels like the uh, travel channel and uh you know the quality i think the quality varies from one show to the next but what it's done is remove the stigma that used to be attached to having a ghostly experience i have found people much more open uh with their ghost tales than they used to be because they know now it's more accepted right. to have these experiences. And, of course, that's a boon to someone like me who who loves collecting ghost stories, particularly updates of old stories. And I, in a small way, have contributed to them myself, although I am not as into paranormal investigating as, as I would be if I had more time, if I weren't working. Yeah. Um, once I retire... I probably will do more of this. Right now, I just enjoy going to, like I say, haunted sites, haunted restaurants, haunted bed and breakfast with my wife, and just <laughs> just letting her uh, attract the ghosts for me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and and the thing is, she doesn't really get scared. Yeah. I guess that's the rational side of her that, that keeps her from screaming. I have had a couple of paranormal experiences, and one of them at the uh, Waverly Hills Tuberculosis Sanitarium. Yeah, have have yeah. you been there? I have not. That is on my bucket list, and it's not—it's not very far from me. A um, couple of hours. Oh yeah. Oh, I, I would. I would recommend that. I would put that on my uh, list of top ten most haunted places in the United States, and I'm sure I'm not the only one who'd, who would put it up there. Uh, a number of these uh, television ghost investigators have gone there. And, of course, they always have experiences. But the people I spoke to before I went there and told me their experiences were people I trusted. I went there, oh, let's see, it was around 2000. The Louisville Ghost Hunters invited me to um, serve as a guest speaker. Well, afterwards, they had a uh, cookout on the grounds of the sanitarium. So we all went out there, had barbecue. And it was getting dark. Uh, I was sitting at a table with uh, Keith and uh, Troy Taylor. He's the president of the American Ghost Society. And uh, they decided the, to break up 
the attendees into groups, and the Louisville Ghost Hunters took these different groups into the sanitarium. Then Keith walked over to Troy and me and uh, Dave Goodman, who has also written, written books about ghosts, actually mostly about forts. And uh, he said, uh, why don't we go to the other end of the sanitarium? So we did, and we uh, we lined up, and we were walking upstairs. And uh, we're on the uh, Keith was on the third floor landing, and he reached out to grab this heavy iron door. Well, before he could touch it, that door opened and slammed shut by itself really fast. Well, huh. Keith, who is not a little guy, he's an ex football player. He he screamed like a girl. That's the only <laughs> way I could describe it. Yeah, and uh, jumped backwards. Well, Roy, uh, well, Troy was in front of me. He jumped back, almost knocked me into into uh, Dave Goodman. Well, I was kind of PO'd about it because I was sure one of the members of Keith's groups were messing around. So I ran up there and grabbed the handle and pulled. This was a heavy door. Yeah. Heavy door. And so with a great deal of effort, I opened it, and I looked up and down the hallway, and I didn't see anything. And then I looked down in front of the door, and there was a single wet footprint the size of a woman's foot. Wow. And, and I tell you, the, the hair rose on my arms. I got goosebumps. And everybody saw it. I said, look at this. And they all saw it. And the interesting thing is all of us have written about this. <laughs> uh, and, and we all agree this is, this is probably the most, most convincing piece of paranormal evidence we've ever seen. Well, Keith told us later on that uh, uh, his group had found those uh, wet footprints all through the building. Wow, that's uh, amazing. Now, I guess, I guess the most common sighting in the sanitarium of the uh, shadow people, we eventually, our little group eventually, united with the smaller groups, and we took a big tour. And uh, there was a, a sighting close to the, there's a room on the third floor where a nurse uh, who found herself in a family way, hanged herself. Yeah. A number of people did see a shadow figure walk from that room across the hallway. I didn't see it. My vision is not the best in the world. So uh, that could be what. But there were five or six people at the same time who said, look, there it is. There's something right there. And um, that's probably the uh, scariest thing that happened when we were there. But uh, this is one of those places where you can tell that there's some kind of there's something in the air. Yeah. I, don't, I, I don't know if it's electrical, but there's some kind of energy there that registers, of course, on EMF detectors and that sort of thing, K2 meters. But I would go there again in a heartbeat. And for um, for anyone listening that doesn't know, uh, Waverly Hills Sanatorium is in Louisville, Kentucky, and it was a tuberculosis hospital. And it is a yeah. massive place. It's like over 300,000 square feet. I think it was about probably 15 years ago now, a lady and her husband bought it and it was in disrepair and it had a few movies shot there. It was in mm -hmm. real bad disrepair. And it's when ghost hunters and stuff started first started coming out in 2015. So probably about 15 years ago. And that's one of the good byproducts, like you were talking about of, of all these ghost shows and stuff is the only more people are talking about it and going to these, these places, but it allows people to buy these places and restore yeah. them and tell the history of the place. Yeah, and you're exactly right. I can't think of the lady's name. Uh, she and her husband do offer ghost tours, and they use the money to restore the building, which is historic. You know, it was an operation from 1926 until 1961, and 1943 with the discovery of streptomycin, which basically cures tuberculosis. There was no need for these huge sanatoriums anymore yeah and eventually closed its doors in 61 but uh, uh it stood abandoned for a long time and there was extensive vandalism and uh, but now it's it's uh it's being repaired and i'm glad to see that and i'm glad to see that it's people who are interested in the paranormal who are the ones who are doing this who are supporting the efforts financially yeah. to uh repair these old buildings and the great thing about that place, I believe their, I can't remember their first name, but their last name is Mattingly, the lady that owns it. Yes. And the great thing about them as well is not only are they interested in the paranormal and, and opening this up for people to come tour and, and for paranormal teams to come investigate, 
but they're also trying to tell the history as much as they can behind the people who worked there and the people who died there and yes, and yes. find as many of the files and names and stuff to honor those people. Yes, that is true. And they have interviewed people who were patients there or who worked there as well. And that kind of oral history is indispensable. Soft furnaces in Birmingham, they've done the same thing. They have their uh, haunted, oh, what do they call it, haunted foundry uh, every Halloween, and the proceeds go toward renovating the building, maintaining the building, that sort of thing. But they have an extensive archives there where they interviewed former employees. And, of course, many of those folks are now dead. And so, uh, yeah, I think I think the paranormal and history go together. Yeah, yeah. Uh, now, the historians I work with wouldn't want, don't like it when I say that <laughs> because they pretty much poo-poo the paranormal, uh, except for one guy. The, uh, I've, he has an office right next to mine. And he goes on all my ghost walks, and he he is a, a historian. But but most a lot of them don't really want to talk about the paranormal, which. Which is frustrating when when you go to a, a battlefield, uh, you know, like Shiloh, and and the guides there tell you, well, we just deal with history. Yeah, we just deal with history. We we don't really care about the ghost stories. Well, that doesn't mean that there aren't ghost stories. I, another problem with Shiloh is that uh, they don't allow night visitors, and a lot of paranormal activity goes on at night, and that might account for a small body of, of ghost lore that comes from Shiloh. There is, however, a subdivision called Shiloh Estates next to it, which is probably built on the battlefield. And those people have heard residual sounds of battles like the uh, uh, roar of cannon and the hollow pop of rifles and screams of men and, and that sort of thing. And so that's those are the kinds of sources you have to go to to get those stories. But there are others where they are more open, I think. Chickamauga, for example. I went to Chickamauga for the first time last, I guess it was a year ago, this past November. 35,000 men died. And, we, and you know that when there's a body count that high, there has to be some kind of residual spiritual energy. And there is there. Yeah. And there are stories, there are ghost stories that go back you know, generations. One of them is the the lady in white. Uh, she was one of these women who um, went out to the battlefield at night after the gunfire had stopped, walked around the bodies looking for their husbands or brothers or lovers. And, and uh, this particular woman, I guess, went insane. Is that the best way to put it? She wore her bridal gown out to the battlefield and and uh, she has been seen carrying a lantern. And she's been seen out there for, like I say, decades people have seen her and passed, this, passed these stories down. I guess the most famous entity out there is uh, probably Old Green Eyes. And Old Green Eyes is a very strange entity. Some people say that it's a, it's a ghost of a, a soldier, that there were uh, two brothers, a Union soldier and a Confederate soldier who uh, fought against each other at Chickamauga, and, what, and the Union soldier killed his brother, and his brother's uh, restless spirit roams the battlefield. Uh, some say that he lost his head, and he's a headless spirit. But that particular story is much older. It predates Chickamauga. The uh, Native Americans said that this was a, a seven- or eight-foot-tall beast covered in hair that was splotched with dried blood, and it had green eyes and fangs. And so it's more of a Bigfoot-type creature. Yeah. I've always found that fascinating, that you've got the two oral traditions that kind of fuse together here uh, in that battlefield. There are some other ghost legends in Chickamauga that are probably apocryphal. There's the Opdyke Memorial. Uh, this was a, uh, uh, a unit, well, they were called Opdyke Tigers. And there, uh, there's a, a statue of a tiger on top of this monument. Well, people have seen a tiger, supposedly seen a tiger roaming around the battlefield. Again, I think some of these witnesses are very imaginative. But it's a good story. 
Yeah, yeah. And uh, there are a number of ghost stories dealing with statues that come alive at night and that sort of thing. So it's not that unusual that that story has grown up there. But, uh, yeah, I've been to both Shiloh and Chickamauga. And uh, I guess I like Chickamauga better because, as I said, the story, there are more ghost stories there or seem to be. And that does not mean that Shiloh is not act, an active paranormal site. just means that the oral traditions aren't as rich there as they are at Chickamauga. Yeah, I've been to the battlefield for the Battle of Murfreesboro. And they, I, I have not been there. Well, they they won't talk to you, of course. The Park Service won't about hauntings or anything, and they're closed at night as well, so nobody can go in there and investigate. But mm-hmm. the area that they call the battlefield now for the park is a very small area of what was the ginormous battlefield where thousands of people died. And so me and the paranormal team I investigate with, we've investigated a building that is on the site of the original battlefield uh-huh. And so there, there's just so many stories. And I've got a, I've got a friend, Alan Searcy, who's an author. I've had him on the show. He just wrote a book about uh, Spirits of Stones River, about Murfreesboro. And a lot of his stories come from those businesses that were built on the battlefield. So a lot of the stories that have been accumulated about the battlefield and, and Civil War soldiers and stuff like that in Murfreesboro come from not the battlefield itself or what you see today, but yeah. the businesses that were built on the original battlefield and, and those, yeah. those businesses being haunted and, and having paranormal activity. Well, that's that's true of Franklin, too. Yes, yeah. which uh, I, I I imagine most of that battlefield's probably been lost. I heard that there are there are plans though to reclaim it. Yeah, they've been reclaiming lots of it. I live about twenty minutes from Franklin. Yeah, there's lots of places over there. I I investigated the Lotes House uh, not so long ago over there in Franklin. Mm. And yeah, that's an awesome place. And then Carton Plantation, I grew up. Uh, oh yeah, I've been to Carton Plantation so many times. That is notoriously haunted around here. There's lots of stories about Carton and yeah. Carton. They they actually um, the historical trust that owns Carton actually reclaimed the battlefield, which was the they had turned it into a golf course with a bunch of houses. Oh and, my goodness! Uh, well, a few years ago, but I guess about five ten years ago, they t- they bought the the golf course and they have reclaimed oh. it as battlefield, and they tried to put the earthworks back in as they would have been. And they've got Good. you know walkways and historical markers, and you can you can do a self guided tour. Yeah, oh, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I've been to Carton, and I believe that's the one. But it was used as a field hospital, yes. as so many of these Annabella mansions were. And I believe that's the one on the second floor where it's where they did the uh, amputations, and they put the limbs in this wooden bucket, and you can still see the ring on the floor, a bloody ring. Where the bucket stood. Yeah, it's a it's almost a perfect circle of yes. where there's no yeah. blood and there's definite you can definitely see the blood stains on the floor. There's another mark on the floor in the blood stains too, where it looked like a doctor had an apron on. And it's kind of like yeah. a longer a longer oval type shape, but it looks like somebody wearing like a plastic apron or a rubber apron and the blood just running off and where he was standing. Oh yeah, there's no blood, but it's all everywhere else around there. Yeah. Oh my goodness. I've I've had some I've had some personal paranormal experiences and I've had some friends that've had paranormal experiences at at Carton. Really, really. Yeah, what kind of experience yeah. have you had there? When when I was a teenager, the thing to do around here this is before all the ghost shows and all that stuff. Um, the thing to do when you're in high school in in the town I live in in Fairview and then Franklin and Brentwood was to sneak in a car on the grounds of Carton Plantation and ghost hunt at night. And nobody ever messed with anything. Everybody's just up there trying to get spooked, basically. But me and my friends were serious about it. One night we were walking around the house on the outside. You couldn't go in because that had a security system and all that. And like I said, we weren't up there to mess with anything. Uh, but we're walking around to what is actually the front side of the house. It's the smaller porch. And I saw a lady in a white gown pull the curtains back and poke her head in the window like she was looking out to see who was coming up the, up the front drive to see them. I've heard cannon fire, gunshots, heard what sounded like singing you were talking about that earlier with the slaves it sounds like yeah. it sounds like old spiritual singing yeah um, i've had friends who have seen full body apparitions of of civil war soldiers up there oh um, my goodness yeah lots of stuff i just love stories like that and there's so many of them in the south i, I guess i guess it's because of if uh, so many southern states have battlefields yeah uh, so much wholesale death here then again, you've also got the uh, 
uh, institution of slavery, and there, uh, there are a lot of ghost stories in the South pertaining to slaves and, and that sort of thing. So I guess you could say that the tragic history of the South is, is, has become a good thing for, for folklorists and ghost hunters and just historians in general. Yeah, and I know in Middle Tennessee, especially, one of the theories in, in the paranormal world is that quartz and granite, which has quartz in it, can hold on to like the residual haunting type stuff, like a recording on the atmosphere. Um, and we have, that's what all that we have around here is granite and quartz. There's lots of it. And so people think that that kind of amps up the, the paranormal activity, whether it be a residual haunting or yeah. an intelligent haunting. Yes, yes, I have heard that. Uh, water, too, is supposed to be a conductor. Yeah, and we and we have part of the Mammoth Cave system runs down through Middle Tennessee too yeah. from up in Kentucky and it's the largest cave system in the world and they don't even know how far it goes. Mhm. And so yeah, lots of lots of underground reservoirs and water. Yeah, this is uh Yeah, Tennessee is uh as I said, it's it's one of my my favorite haunted states to go to. Now, we've got lots of ghost stories in in my neck of the woods in Alabama and Mississippi. But nothing like what you all have up in Tennessee. Yeah, and like in Franklin, I mean, especially the the historic part of Franklin, you can't, you couldn't throw a rock from one, you know, one house to another without hitting a house that has panorama activity. Like anybody that lives in some of those historic houses, then you have like the Lotes House, which they've started doing ghost tours and renting it out uh, to to paranormal research teams. Then you have right across the street, you have the Carter House. And then not far from there is yep. Carton Plantation, and that all three of those houses have stories of paranormal stuff. And then all the businesses that are through there too um, have lots of lots of stories of things that people have mm-hmm. experienced. And and think of all the people who go to Franklin. You got a lot of them who are interested in history, of course. But you got a lot of people who are interested in the ghost stories too, and they help keep these businesses and these house museums going. Yeah. And uh, uh, and in Carton Plantation, they won't talk to you about it unless you go during like their lantern tours they do in October. Right. Um, yeah. Generally, they will not. I've asked and asked and asked when I get when I've gone up there, and uh, and they just generally won't tell you any stories. They just don't right. want any part of it. Yes. Yes. Of course, it's been written about in so many places that you can you can get the stories. You just have to get them like secondhand. You have to get them <laughs> and on the internet or in in uh, books. Yeah, but uh, I, I had the same experience. I couldn't get anyone to really say anything about it. Uh, I think, in fact, I think one lady said, "We well, need to take the ghost tour." I bet probably I would imagine that's probably a big fundraiser for them. Yeah, and with the with the uh, COVID stuff going on this year, it's it's hurt a lot of those places because people aren't yes. you know they've had to close for so long, and then people just aren't going like they used to and going on vacation and traveling. And with Middle Tennessee being a huge tourist area. They're just not getting those dollars. So, like the Lotes House yeah. never never did ghost tours before, um, since they've been open in like 2010. I think they opened as the Lotes House Museum, but they never did paranormal tours. They never let ghost uh, hunters come in and rent it out. And now they're doing it just to survive. And yeah. and so a lot of them are turning to that, you know, because they know it's a huge area of income. Even though, like you know, a lot of them are run by historians. Like you said, you know, the historians kind of have the pushback with the with the spirit stuff, mm-hmm. but. Um, yeah, they just, uh, I talked to Thomas Cartwright at, at Lotus house when I was there investigating and, and that's, he's, he's a historian, he's a civil war historian and that's his main thing. But, you know, just to survive during the COVID they've had to open it up and, and I think they've had a good time with it. Well, that's it. You have a good time with it. Have fun with it. As I said, the stigma attached to ghost is, is fading. Uh, of course, at least, at least we live in the in the Bible Belt here, so there there are some objections to the paranormal, any mention of it. Yeah, uh, but not like there used to be, and and it is a it is a financial boon to some of these these old houses. We've got one here in Meridian, Mississippi, uh, Merrill Hope, which has a Civil War history, and uh, it, it's it's really haunted. We've I've had some experiences there, and. And I've been pleading with the with the ladies' club who owns it to open it up to ghost tours, and they're reluctant to do it. They want to just focus on the history, but I'm not sure how much longer they're going to be able to just do 
to resist the temptation to have ghost tours. Yeah, and I th- and, but and, I, but I think kind of like you're going back to what you were saying earlier. The the paranormal stuff is part of the history, and the history yeah. is part of the paranormal. They go hand in hand, and so they do. And so you know that's why not have that added layer of history where maybe you can catch a voice of somebody who actually lived about, you know, the people that you talk about on your regular tours. Well, now you, you have a, a paranormal team that's captured this voice saying a name yeah. or, you know, telling you something about history and giving you a little more insight into it. Well, to get up close and personal with history, right? through EVPs and full body apparitions and that sort of thing. So yeah. you have written many, many books and you just had, I know this one just came out, um, here recently, the one, uh, the Haunted yes. South. Uh, do you have any any projects in the works in the future that you'd that you'd like to tell us about? Or? Yeah, um, well, I've got one that is well, just came out in September, Mississippi Legends and Lore, and um, I've got a book on Louisiana, Louisiana Legends and Lore that's going coming out in February. The History Press is publishing it, and that's a book that I wrote in the spring. During the pandemic, when all our classes were uh, online, I had all this time on my hands. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I wrote that book. That's one of the few good things to come out of the pandemic. Yeah. Uh, gives people like me a lot of time <laughs> to, to do something productive. Anybody can find your books on Amazon and other online retailers. Check them out. Um, I'm glad you, you do a lot of the Haunted America series, and I've been talking to, to a few other authors from there and and they have some yes. great they have some great books from that publisher. Yes, so yeah. The history press is really good about promoting promoting the paranormal. I'm not I can't say for sure what percentage of their business comes from the Haunted America series, but my guess would be a considerable percentage. Yeah, they've got a lot of those books. Well, a lot of them. A lot of them. I've got a couple bookshelves full of them. And I like the fact that they are really concerned about the smaller stories, parts of the country that don't get a lot of attention. Yeah. And those are the kinds of stories I like to read. And they're the ones that I try to dig up, too, as much as I can. Uh, all I talk about the big places that everyone knows, too. You almost have to if you're going to, to do a book that's representative of, a, of stories from a specific state or region. But, uh, but I like the ones that are just known to people in a small town. Yeah. Those are the little gems that I loved picking up, and paranormal groups enjoy going to those places, too. And I think... Because they're local. Because they're local. I think it's great that that there are authors out there like you and and some others that I've talked to that want to keep that folklore tradition going and that oral history going by doing smaller places and less well-known places with my show here, I've, I'm trying to focus a lot of my shows on the smaller, less known places. Um, yes. because people, you know, on the, on the show, on the TV shows and stuff, you see all these, these bigger places, these more well-known places, or they become well-known because they've been on five different TV shows. But I want right. to, I want to spotlight these smaller places so that maybe we can drive some of this paranormal tourism business to them. So they do survive. Exactly. Exactly. And, you know, like we've been saying, businesses need tourist dollars. And this is one way to get them. Yeah, yeah. And a lot of them are nonprofit. So they rely yeah. strictly on people coming and visiting and touring and, and all that. Right. And that's why I, I like being interviewed of, on podcasts, because at least the ones I've talked to are, are concerned about about keeping these traditions alive and, and about using these stories to enrich people's lives and rich communities. I think we do more than just entertain. We educate, too. I like to do both. I do it when I teach on campus, and I try to do it in my books, too. And I think a lot of a lot of people involved in the paranormal are interested in the same kinds of goals. Yeah, and that, that's part of the reason why I want to talk to you on my show is because I share that same passion. That's why I started this show was to not only entertain people with, with the ghost stories they want to hear, but teach them a little bit about, even if it's just a little bit about the history of places that they didn't know. Mm-hmm. And and maybe mm-hmm. even some places in their own backyard they never heard of and didn't know any of the history. Oh, I didn't know their Civil War history, or I didn't know this happened, this murder, or whatever happened at that particular place. 
And so, mm-hmm. yeah, and, and I love talking to people like you, and it's been a great conversation today, and I, I appreciate you so much for coming on the show. Well, I appreciate you having me. I, I tell you, I just jump at the opportunity to do this because it gets the word out that those of us who promote the paranormal are not crazy or weird, but we are people who are interested in learning things. Right. Learning things that are historical and then maybe learning about the other world, whatever that is. Yeah, and, and keeping an open mind. And Yes, yeah. keeping an open mind, exactly. Exactly. You have to have that in order to, to really make any kind of progress, I think. Well, Dr. Brown, once again, I thank you for coming on the show today. Everybody go check out Dr. Alan Brown's books on Amazon. He has books about lots of different locations. And I hope that you would be willing to come on again in the future, and we'll talk about some other haunted history. I'll be happy to. Thank you so much. You have a good day. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for listening to the show today. Y'all have a good day. Stay safe out there. Join us next time for a new episode of The Unseen Paranormal. Until then, check us out on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at our website, unseenparanormalpodcast.com. And don't forget to like, review, rate, and share with all your friends. Thank you to my friend Chris Lips for the awesome theme music. Listen to our theme song and more of his music at chrislipsmusic.com. And remember, some of the scariest things are unseen. <laughs>